Hello, I'm Sharon Ross with the Capital City Arts Initiative. We are here at the Lilly Museum at the University of Nevada, Reno with Vivian Zavataro. She's the curator of the Lilly and she's going to tell us about all that is happening here at this beautiful museum and gallery. Vivian, hello, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for having me. Vivian's been director and curator here for several years, and we're delighted to have her give us a tour and talk about the museum and its collection. Um, so, Vivian, we're welcome to Northern Nevada. We're delighted that you're here. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I've been in the Lily for three years now, uh, next month, so that's uh, my anniversary. <laughs> Good. Um, and it's been wonderful to get to curate and interact with the Northern Nevada community. Uh, it's been my, my absolute p pleasure. Good. Well, I know you've been uh, traveled all over the world, so what surprises you most about our desert state? I love the landscape. Actually, uh, it's been really cool to see, you know, all the the fauna and uh, the flora here. I love the the wild horses. Um, I, I know Justin, our preparator here at the museum, he hates the horses because <laughs> he has too many of them uh, over by his house. But I, I I just absolutely love to see them roaming around and free and. Um, I, yeah, it's been a, it's been great being here. Good. Reno, yeah. Good. Well, we're we're delighted you're here. So you've been at UNR for three years. <clears throat> so give us a, a brief overview of the Lilies because it's it's a, a big institution. So tell us about its mission and um, what you're aiming to achieve. So we um, our vision is to be a bold uh, art center. Uh, so we do what, what everything we do here. We think about the relevancy for the communities here that we serve. So um, since its inception, my predecessor also had the same goal, Paul Baker Prindle. Um, so since the inception of the museum in 2019, all of our exhibits um, have been focusing on groups that haven't been represented in museums. So. Uh, we've ha we have had the first solo uh, Native American contemporary artist here, um, uh, Diane Whitehawk. Um, that was Paul's uh, that, that brought her that brought her here. Um, our last exhibit uh, in Medio featured uh, Latinx artists and artists that immigrated to the United States recently. Um, so we just trying to uh, highlight these voices that have been ignored uh, for many, many years in the art world. So we just want to make sure that everybody has a chance to be featured in our space. Good. That's good. <laughs> That's good for all of us in the community. So um, t talk more about the increasing interaction with the public. How do you achieve that? Uh, we try to, you know, by bringing uh, artists from different backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, we hope that people see themselves in the museum. You know, me growing up, uh, I grew up in Brazil, and I love, I have always loved museums, but I, I would go to museums and see art made only by white men, right? And I didn't see myself in the, the museum space as a, as a Latina woman, right? And that creates a, a gap, you know, if you don't see yourself within the walls of, of an institution, you don't want to come back, you don't feel represented, you don't feel that your voice is being represented within those spaces. So by having a diverse uh, program and, a di and exhibitions that feature not only white male artists, but artists from all backgrounds, we hope to bring more people in and hope to welcome them, that, that they feel welcome in our museum. Good. That's good. <laughs> so tell us about this exhibition, um, yeah. in, Inside the Box? Following the Box. Following the Box. That was yeah. close. Uh, so uh, this, at the Lily, we have about three exhibitions, temporary exhibitions a year. Uh, this is one of them, Following the Box. We just opened it last week and it will be on view uh, until September 16th, so uh, make sure you come uh, again because there's a lot to take in. It's a very dense exhibit. It's a lot of history, uh, a lot of, um, just a lot of information to take in.
story behind it is really interesting. It's, a, it's like a mystery, you know. So these two curators from Chicago, they went to a state sale close to their home in Evanston and found this box, this shoe box, under a couch. Um, were full of um, these original photographs and they were like whoa this is really cool let's purchase it and they purchased for 20 bucks right and that was uh, that was a, a very long time ago I think they said about two, 25 years ago and the, the box kind of stayed around and they uh, you know all of a sudden they're like okay now let's check it out let's see what this is about uh, they took it to some workshops that they did with students and interns but then they're like who took these photos and where uh, and then a lot of research they got a Fulbright uh, to go to India so that's where the idea of following the box started because uh, you know, they found out that those photographs were taken in India, but where and by whom, uh, and started following the box and the research kind of grew and grew and grew, and they decided to make into an exhibit and a film. So there's a film as well uh, related to this project. And it, when in India, they ask Indian artists to create responses, contemporary Indian artists to create responses to these photographs taken by an American photographer which they now know was a GI, uh, but they still don't know who he is. Really? There's no, yes. they don't know? They don't know yet. But what I think is amazing and fascinating about this exhibit is that even though they don't know uh, who the photographer is, that's actually part of how, uh, you know, the exhibit kind of happened. Because if they knew who the photographer was, the responses from the Indian artists would have been completely different because the Indian artists are, are reflecting on this mystery or on this like uh, mysterious person that they don't know who it is you know it would be interesting just taking that idea further if there would be a grandchild yes because it would exactly. probably be a grand that generation yes. grandchild that would say my grandpa that was those. my that exactly. And that's what they they're thinking now that the project has been around for a decade. Um, they were like, "Well, it would be cool now to find who he is, um, and then you know perhaps con connect with a grandchild, and uh, you know be like, well, how cool would it be to know that your grandpa affected so many people with." his photographs. It, it's a very powerful exhibit. Yeah. Thank you is. for bringing it. Yes, I'm, I'm really excited.
Shunandini Barnaji, uh, this artist. Uh, she's going to be coming to Reno. Uh, she's leaving India tomorrow, actually, and she will be giving a workshop on collage and design at 1 p.m. on July 28th, and an artist talk the same day at 6 p.m. And on July 29th, the curators will, will be uh, giving a walkthrough. So they'll be going uh, from artist to artist, explaining everything and their connection to the box. Uh, at, so July 29th at 5.30 p.m. Perfect. Yes. Good. Thank you. So Vivian, on the map, tell us more about the origin of these photographs. So the original photographs that they found in the state sale, some of them are featured in the exhibit here. So you can see there's some of them here. We have some uh, in the vitrine as well. So as I said, there's a lot to take in when you come see this show. But after a lot of research, they found out that these photographs are taken in an army base in Bengal and uh, right here where this red uh, in a very small um, town in Bengal so I really like the way you know the maps here the the history of the original photographs and then also you can see some of these there's a 127 if I'm not wrong in this box but some of them are featured in the exhibit and i think they are they're just amazing to look at there's a you know you look at them and you see history you know right there on them Vivian, um, so the museum is all presents all permanent collection that belongs to the university. Yeah. So as I said, so the downstairs we have temporary exhibits that you know coming they come and stay for three months, and most of them focus on works that are on loan from artists, other museums, galleries, collectors. But upstairs here we dedicate to our permanent collection. So all the objects you see here we own them is here uh, part of the university's collection or their promised gifts so they're coming to us um, soon and so we, we can still use them for permanent collection this place so 
this permanent collection display here that you see is just a fraction of our collection. We have about 5,500 objects in our collection and here you see about 80 of them. So as you can see, it's just like a tiny little bit, uh, a tiny little snippet of our collection. And what is amazing about this permanent collection display is it's very dynamic. You see that most museums, they organize their collection display chrono chronologically. But if you have a big museum like the Met or the Louvre, it makes sense because they have objects that can give you a very clear idea of our history. But in a smaller museum like ours, if we tried to do a chronological display, you would have a lot of holes and it would be really hard to explain, okay, you know, we have a 5,000 year old objects and the next one is like, 3,000 years old, you know? So it would be really hard to explain these gaps in our collection. So having them grouped um, by themes, we have the chance of uh, creating dialogues between different periods, different, between different cultures, between different media. So it's very dynamic in that way. One thing that you'll notice here is that there are no labels. And I get asked a lot, why? I spend a lot of time on museologists, so my research focus on museums and audience interaction. So I spend a lot of time really like sitting in museums and just seeing how visitors interact with art. And most of the time visitors go like this, label, 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 and then they go like, ah, oh, Picasso, and then they stop because they recognize that artist's name. So, you know, if they see a name that they cannot pronounce or if they see a name there's too many consonants on, they don't stop because they're like, I don't know this, so I'm not going to look at the art. So by taking the labels out of the equation, we give visitors the chance of finding new artists that they like. And then I tell people, go around, connect with the art. As humans, we have that in us. We don't need to be art historians. We don't need to be museologists to look at art and to appreciate it. So I say, go around, look at the art, see some things that you like, and then get the little booklet. We have books for, for people to borrow. We have them for sale. We also have, can, we have a QR code that you can have it on your phone for free. And then look at the information of the pieces you like. You might find an artist that you didn't know before. So does the Lily host and set up tours, school children tours? We do a lot of tours throughout the year. Um, we have some volunteer docents, some interns that guide them. And depending on the age of the group, uh, we have different activities that we offer. Uh, but we really like having the little ones here. It's, it brings a lot of energy and their perspectives really, really inspire me, just like Emil's. Um, so we really love having them here. Our collection is very diverse. We have objects from all over the world. Uh, we also have objects that are very dear to our local community here and uh, Nevadan artists that are famous uh, outside of Nevada, right? Like Bob Morrison we have here. Uh, we really love this piece and it's very unique and we're really proud to have in our collection. Um, one inter another interesting aspect of uh, this permanent collection display is that we included community voices in here in order to give people other perspectives besi besides the curator. So if you go around, you see there are little pamphlets uh, in some of the pieces here uh, at the Lily. And I specifically like this one. So this, um, and you know, visitors are welcome to take them home if they like. Uh, so this is a second grader, his name is Emil, and he describes these two vases. So again, just to show you that you don't need to be an art historian, you don't need to be an academic to appreciate art, right? So here's, here's what Emil says about these two vases. I think these vases are cool because they have a lot of imagination. The two specific birds look like peacocks. It reminds me of this dragon that has a lot of feathers. There is a story of this one boy. He had a dream that he, will, he was on a ship and the ship wrecked. The dragon came and saved his life, and he didn't even realize as these dragons are so quick. I really like that story. I also think there's a lot of life in these pieces. I really like nature. My friends do too. Sometimes we play nature games, and they have taught me so much about it. There is so much detail on these vases, but when you first look at it, you just see a couple birds, leaves, branches, and flowers. When you look close at it, at it 
you can see the strokes of the artist's paintbrush and the sculpting they did. There's also Chinese writing on them. I don't know what it means, but I have a Chinese friend and she might be able to tell me what it's saying. I think it might be a story about birds flying through the sky, then landing on a branch. The two colorful birds were magical and I'm not sure what else it, could, it would say, but I think they're telling a pretty good story and it would be cool to read that. And I think that is really, you know, not only Emil, it, 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 he's able to describe these really well, but it gives adults another way of seeing these that you wouldn't have. It's kind of like giving you other lenses to see this artwork. So throughout the, the exhibit, you can see these little papers and everybody that chose to write uh, about these pieces, they, they gave themselves a funny title. So Emil gave himself the title Second Grader, Animal Lover. I wrote one and I think my title is uh, High Energy Brazilian Italian Museologist. I don't know. There is a lot of funny uh, titles around here, but just showing you that we can all talk about art. We can all uh, use art as a vehicle for uh, dialogue and change.
So I want to show you some of my favorite objects, but also give you an idea of the breadth of our collection. Um, these uh, little sculptures here we have, uh, they're called Shaptis, and they're Egyptian figurines. They are about 3,000 years old, um, and I really, I really love them because, you know, they've been touched so much, you can tell, um, by uh, the patina on them. Um, and they're very interesting. They have hieroglyphs here on them. I don't, I'm not an expert in Egyptian art by any means, but um, it's really cool to have them at the museum and also give uh, some of our visitors the opportunity to touch them. We also have these Roman um, little figurines. They're really interesting. See them. The kids love these guys. How old are those? They, they're probably from 8th century uh, BC before our common era. I love this one because of the little hole. So most likely it was uh, for a necklace or some sort of uh, ornament. Mm -hmm. So this is our oldest object in the collection. It's about 5,000 years old from Neolithic China. And we refer to it as uh, the first refrigerator. Uh, so it's a storage, a storage jar. Most likely at the time, um, people would store grains or oils in there. The part that is not um, decorated would go in, in under the, the earth, right? And then keep uh, the, the, the contents of the, the, the vase fresh. Uh, and then the, the part that showed above the, the floor is decorated beautifully. And it's really in quite an amazing shape and good condition. But uh, we, this is the oldest one in our collection.
So I wanted to show you a couple of my favorites from our collection that are not on display. Uh, so a couple of our jams in our collection that people don't know that we have. We have actually a really nice collection of Donna Ferrato. Donna Ferrato is a photojournalist, internationally recognized. Uh, so Donna Ferrato is not only a photographer, but also uh, an activist. And she really works to bring more awareness about uh, domestic violence. Yes. And I wanted to show you three of uh, the pieces that we have. Um, we have a lot more by her, but this one is titled Deanna, and it shows uh, as Deanne uh, uh, living with the enemy in Minneapolis. This photograph is from 1987, and it shows um, victim of abuse. We have Rita. So uh, this is uh, the cover of Living with the Unbeatable Woman. Just her, you know, her photographs are very uh, powerful, very uh, detailed. You can you can see the pain and the in the suffering. Um, I love Donna Ferrato's and how her gaze can capture uh, not only suffering but also the strength of this of these women. The last one I will show you is this one. I love this image and it's it's titled battered lesbian and it's Pam with a portrait of uh, her abuser so uh, a couple jams from our collection I think a lot of people don't know we have these um, we have uh, an Auguste Renoir here at our collection it's an etching which is I I love it. You can see his, uh, you know, his style, uh, but in another medium. Another gem from our collection is uh, this piece by Kate Kollowitz. It's from the late 1800s. It's a self-portrait, also an etching. Um, Kate Kollowitz is an incredible German artist. Um, she did a lot of work that portrayed the war incredibly powerful as well. We have this book called Derrière les Miroirs and um, there's a lot of people that actually have this book. It's not incredibly uh, you know, special to have it, but what makes this particular book special is that it was actually signed by Needle. So this is a lithograph, um, but he has his signature. So there's a lot of people that own these books, but not with the artist's signature. Unfortunately, this is the only one that we have the signature because it has other artists featured in this book. Georges Braque, Calder, but they, these are not signed, so whoever we also don't know the provenance of this object, but whoever had it was able to capture uh, Mido at some point and had him sign it. We have a lot of Nevada art. We have a lot of uh, many Lyle balls. We have some. We have some sea grease.
We also have a lot of Pinoyers. We, we also have many uh, Jim McCormick's, Bob Morrison, Latimer. I also really like this. Uh, I also really like this piece by Rosita Todorova, who is a contemporary um, Nevada artist. We have one of her, two of her pieces in our collection, actually. And we have many incredible uh, Craig Shepherds here. One of my favorites is this horse. Uh, from Craig Shepherd. Vivian, thank you so much for your gen generous tour. It was wonderful seeing everything that you're doing here at the Lily, and we're thrilled you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for featuring the Lily. Well, thank it's you. our pleasure. Um, you will find more CCI videos for Nevada neighbors and exhibitions on our website, ccainv.org, and the following slide will list our generous funders. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon.